Okay, um, welcome everyone. Um, thank you very much for, for coming today. My name is Eleanor Huntington. I'm Professor and Head of the School of Engineering and IT here at UNSW Canberra on the uh, Australian Defence Force Academy site. Um, I'll be giving a brief presentation today. There will be lots of opportunities for question and answer, so think up some good questions and, and I'll uh, try to get them answered for you. Uh, before we get too far into the um, talk, just a couple of administrative um, things. We have uh, two exits um, here, and uh, in the unlikely event, event of an emergency, a uh, face mask will drop down from the compartment overhead. No, no. Uh, no, no, but there, there is a master point. Um, the emergency evacuation point is the uh, AFL oval. For those of you who can spot AFL goalposts, just go there. Um, otherwise, find the, the nearest person in uniform and they will direct you to the right place. Um, so what I'm going to be doing, welcome, come in. It's only voluntary audience participation. I'm not Barry Humphreys. Um, uh, what we'll be doing today is talking about um, the Bachelor of Engineering, Bachelor of Technology and Bachelor of IT degrees that we have um, here. And um, uh, we'll go, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, both how the degrees are run, but also where they might take people in their careers in the uh, Australian Defence Forces. So we'll kick off, first of all, uh, with a little bit of a um, uh, uh, discussion of the campus. So this picture um, is, a, is an aerial photograph of um, the Australian Defence Force Academy. There's basically a dividing line um, on this picture that runs down the, the middle vertically. And pretty much everything on the left uh, of the picture that you can see is where all of the um, military uh, operations of the campus occur. So th these are the places where um, the cadets and midshipmen live, it's where the cadets mess is, it's where the sports hall is, it's where the military staff have their offices, it's where the military education and training program occurs. Everything on the right is essentially where the <coughs> University of New South Wales conducts its operations. Um, and it's where all the, the, uh, the academic staff of the four schools here have their offices, it's where the lecture theatres are, it's where we run our undergraduate laboratories and so forth. So the School of Engineering and IT uh, is the largest school uh, in this uh, campus. It's also actually the largest school in all of the University of New South Wales. We occupy five of um, the buildings on the right hand side of the campus. We have um, around about half of the undergraduate students, more than half of the postgraduate coursework students and much more than half of the postgraduate research students. So let's kick off with a, with a warm up question. Any thoughts on what engineers actually do? No one? All too shy? They design things, absolutely. What else? All right, let me make it a bit more concrete. Imagine I go into Woolies. Um, how many flavours of engineering might get involved in that experience for me to go and buy some carrots at Woolies? <laughs> yeah, okay, pick one. Pick one flavour of engineer. Okay, civil engineer. So I should declare my allegiances right now. I'm an electrical engineer. Um, so to me, civil engineering is dirt and concrete, but there's a lot of dirt that got moved to make the building and a lot of concrete that went into the building. So I agree with that. Civil engineering is one of them. What else? Structural engineering. Automotive. Automotive engineering, because somebody had to um, design and build the trucks that got the carrots there in the first place. Electrical. Electrical engineering, lights, fridges, all of that sort of stuff, absolutely. Is there aeronautical Good question. What do you think? <laughs> I like that answer. Good. Um, so so I, if I wanted to buy tomatoes in Canberra in the middle of winter, they had to come from somewhere else. Um, and I reckon probably planes are involved at some point. So yes, let's, let's include aeronautical engineering. Okay. Mechanical engineering, absolutely. So um, mechanical engineering covers automotive engineering. It also, for example, would be um, involved in the design of the shelves so that they can stack that full of stuff without collapsing on us. Can we get aviation in there? How would aviation get in there? The pilots, that flew the, the pilots that flew the planes that got the carrots there. I like that. That's good. <laughs> IT? Cash the registers. cash registers. So when you scan your stuff and a price, hopefully the right one, comes out, that's IT. So the point is, engineers 
do, get involved in a lot of stuff. And if you think about um, what we've been talking about, it's not just about the des design of the things that we're using. So it wasn't just about the design of the trucks that got um, the carrots there. It was also about, if we're going to talk about planes, there's through life maintenance of the planes. So whenever you're waiting uh, at the terminal and Qantas tell you that a plane's been delayed because of technical issues, what's going on is that an engineer has decided that it's not actually safe for that plane to take off. So there's, there's uh, engineers are involved not just in the design of um, cool stuff, they're also involved in the manufacture, the operation and the maintenance of those things. So now, what does that mean for us as a university? What we're interested in is producing graduates who are equipped for their engineering or technology careers. So we're not interested so much in filling people full of interesting factoids, that's part of it, but that's not mostly what we're interested in. What we're interested in is producing people who are smart, adaptable problem solvers who can make um, professionally uh, informed decisions, um, sometimes quickly and on the fly and under stressful circumstances. So for example, if you're a mechanical engineer on a ship out in the middle of the Pacific and something breaks, you will be the one who's tasked with making a decision about whether or not you can bodgy something together to limp into, sh into the nearest port <coughs> or whether we have to call in a helicopter to drop a replacement part. So this is, this is not just about being filled full of factoids, it's about being able to solve problems uh, in the face of often quite a great deal of uncertainty. So that's our role as a university. Um, let me give you a, a, a really nice example of um, a place where uh, engineering got itself a little bit disconnected from um, its, the, the uh, community in which it was meant to be working to give you an illustration of what we mean by having engineers grounded in their, in their community. So who's heard of the Iridium system? No? Okay. Who's heard of satellite phones? Heard of satellite phones? So you can, you can make a phone call in the middle of the Australian desert, which is just amazing. Uh, so the Iridium system was actually conceived, it, it, again, I'm an electrical engineer, it's a thing of engineering beauty. Um, it's a constellation of satellites that are actually in orbit around the planet right now. Um, it was conceived as one of the very first satellite phone <coughs> constellations in the world. It was constructed at, at a cost of $60 billion uh, and it's a, a total disaster, complete disaster. The reason it was a disaster was because Partly it was a problem um, looking for a solution. It was a little bit ahead of its time. But more importantly, it's, um, the, the way that it was engaged with the community was just completely fundamentally flawed. The salesmen who were going out and selling the handsets that go with the Iridium system um, were able to convince people that it would be a really good idea to be able to make a phone call in the middle of the Australian desert. So they sold people handsets for several thousand dollars but didn't tell them that it wouldn't be functional until the whole constellation was launched about five years later. Uh, so it was a financial disaster. And the, the company that, that designed and built and operated the Iridium system uh, ended up having to sell it. Now remember it was constructed for 60 billion, they sold it for 25 million. So that's less than one cent in the dollar they got back. The company that bought it made a profit of $240 million the first year they were operating it. So for them it was a fa fabulous value proposition. But the point is, it was an idea that was well grounded in its time and they were selling people realistic expectations about how this thing would work. So it's a good example of the way that engineering has to be um, uh, well located within its context at the time. To give you another example, how many of you are from out of town? Well, excellent. Okay, welcome to Canberra. Um, when you came in, uh, did you notice that big tower that's on one of the hills in the city? That, that's, that's called the Telstra Tower. At the time that it was constructed, it was highly controversial. And the reason for that was because um, people considered it to be a complete blot on the landscape. While it's technically necessary to have something that's you know, an architectural statement sitting on top of a mountain where you've shaved the top off the mountain is a bit of a um, bold statement to be making. So um, our goal as a university is to be able to produce graduates who are both capable of designing and constructing that tower, but also engaging in the, thoughtfully in the debate about whether or not it should be constructed at all. So uh, engineers are expected to uh, exercise their professional judgment, not just be able to design the world's best widget. Um, okay, so now let's talk a little bit about our school. 
So um, CIT stands for the School of Engineering and IT. Uh, we have three flavours of students. We have undergraduate students. These, these people are, the vast majority of them are uniformed defence personnel. We have a small number of civilian students who are on cadetships from the Defence Materiel Organisation. Um, they represent a, a small but valued minority of our undergraduate student population. We have postgraduate coursework students. These are people who have come to us uh, to do master's degrees and things like that. Um, they are, th those places are open to anyone who satisfies the university entry requirements to get into a master's. Um, and the vast majority of them come from within defence, but there's no requirement to do so. We also have uh, postgraduate research students. These are people who are studying basically um, to get PhDs. Um, in terms of staff, we have three flavours of staff as well. We have academics. They're, um, they're people like me. We've done our PhDs and we love to bang on and on and on and on and on about our favourite um, piece of technical uh, in information at the time. And we're the people who give the lectures, design the courses, um, run the labs, run the tutorials, mark the assignments, all of that sort of stuff. We have administrative staff um, who are there to help um, both you and us uh, get, get our way through the um, sometimes serpentine paperwork that the University of New South Wales uh, requires of us. Uh, and we also have a large body of technical staff. Um, we, are, we are one of the few university campuses left in the country that still has um, very substantial um, uh, uh, laboratories and workshops that, are, uh, that the undergraduate students can access and these technical staff are there to support that side of what it is we do. Okay, so these pictures. Um, interestingly, the one on the top right kind of looks like it comes from Doctor Who, but anyway. Um, the one on the left, let's talk about the one on the left. The point about this picture is to talk about um, uh, how engineers engage not just with the community but also with each other. So uh, we, we will be spending a lot of today talking about um, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, aeronautical engineering, that sort of stuff. Um, but to actually make any compl complex project come to fruition, we need engineers and technologists of all flavours. So for example, the picture on the, on the top left is um, for a hydroelectric system. So you, know, you hear the word electric and you think, okay, electrical engineering. But um, I would suggest that Again, noting my, under, my limited understanding of civil engineering, I would suggest I can see quite a lot of both dirt and concrete there. Um, so that's probably got some civil engineering involved as well. Um, most um, Australian Defence Force projects are complicated beasts um, and they will also involve <coughs> multiple flavours of engineers and technologists uh, in, their, um, in their life cycle. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the kinds of careers that uh, you guys might have if you were to come and do one of our degrees <coughs> and also join the ADF. So we'll kick off with um, electrical engineering um, and the first thing to talk about in terms of flavours of engineering, um, engineering actually started life in its long history as being basically for military applications. So and in fact one of the most, the most famous military engineers uh, was Leonardo da Vinci who designed a huge number of siege engines and all sorts of, and helicopters and all sorts of stuff during his time. And the idea of having civilian applications for engineering really only emerged about 250 <coughs> years ago. And so that's actually the origin of the word, of the phrase civil engineering. It does indeed, mean, it, its original meaning was indeed not military engineering. Um, civil engineering uh, uh, evolved over time and a whole bunch of sub-disciplines emerged and that's how we first got then mechanical engineering as being distinct from um, what we now think of as civil engineering. Then we got electrical engineering and we've got these days materials engineering, mining engineering, all sorts of different flavours of engineering. So electrical engineering, um, you spend a lot of time thinking about stuff you can't see. So these were the best pictures I could find for electrical engineering, sorry about that. The one on the, top, uh, the, one on the left is actually a photograph of a transformer just outside my house. Um, okay, and of course, being an electrical engineer, all of the really cool stuff that's in your mobile phone, that comes from us. Um, okay, so let's talk a bit about um, electrical engineering um, uh, in the military. So most of the focus is on things like communications, guided weapons, radar systems, that sort of stuff. 
Um, and in the Navy, uh, most of the electrical, our electrical engineering graduates become weapons electrical officers. And they're um, going to be working on areas such as um, the electronic systems that are associated with gun and missile guidance control, uh, navigation systems, uh, communication systems, um, sonar systems, data systems, that sort of stuff. Uh, in the Army, they'll go on to um, either the Signals Corps or to um, the uh, Royal Australian Corps of Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, which, because it's a huge mouthful, I will now call RAMI from, from here on. Um, and they're going to be involved in things like, well, in Signals, it's going to be mostly about communications. Um, uh, in RAMI, it's going to be things like management and repair of state-of-the-art communications equipment, management of guided weapons systems, laser designation systems, all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and in the RAF, electrical engineers will go into looking after um, radar systems, comm systems, computing equipment, um, and they might even go to a um, squadron where they're in charge of avionics equipment and stuff like that. Okay, um, aeronautical engineering. Let's just pause for a moment and take stock of the fact that, in fact, the ADF is the largest operator of aircraft in the country. So it's not Qantas, it's not Virgin, it's the ADF. Uh, and so our aeronautical engineers will basically be meeting the needs of Australia's largest aircraft operator. Uh, and that means all three services. So um, Army and Navy have uh, rotary wing aircraft, that's, that's code for helicopters. Um, and the RAF have fixed wing air aircraft, which we saw a fabulous display about an hour ago. Um, and uh, in, in the Navy and the Army, it's basically about the repair and maintenance of, of helicopters. Um, and in the RAF, it's mostly about operation and maintenance of um, aircraft, uh, fixed wing aircraft, as well as airworthiness um, considerations. And of course, in, in all three services, um, our, our aero engineers get involved in really large acquisition projects. So it's, it's about deciding which is going to be the next um, 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 fighter aircraft uh, that Australia buys and stuff like that. And again, exercising professional engineering judgment. Okay, so civil engineering is the first of the um, uh, engineering flavours where we don't talk about all three services. Can anyone hazard a guess as to why Navy doesn't need civil engineers? Because you can't build a building in the middle of the sea. Correct. <laughs> Concrete doesn't float very well. <laughs> yes. Uh, we don't need roads in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. <coughs> so it's, it, uh, civil engineers go into um, the Army and into the Air Force. So in the Army, they usually go into... Um, the Royal Australian Engineers, and uh, that's actually a fighting corps. These people are involved in designing, constructing um, bridges, roads, all sorts of stuff, usually um, on quick turnaround and for short-term for short purposes to meet operational needs. When I first found out that um, civil engineers were also in the Air Force, I, I have to admit that the same, I went through the same train of thought as with Navy. I did wonder why on earth we needed a road in the sky. Um, but then I realised that you have to land your planes on something. Um, and the something is what the, uh, the uh, airfield engineers do. So uh, civil engineers in the Air Force are involved with airfield engineering. Uh, and again, they can be in forward operations where you're trying to find a landing strip at, um, in some remote location that only needs to be used temporarily. So again, really cool stuff. Um, and for mechanical engineering, uh, that, that's uh, mostly going into the Navy and the Army. Uh, in the Navy, uh, once our mechanical engineers graduate, they tend to go off and do some service-specific training, and they become uh, what the Navy considers marine engineers, uh, and they're responsible for um, uh, actually going to sea sometimes. And th this was the example <coughs> I was talking about in the sense that if um, the propulsion system on a ship breaks down, it's, it's a marine engineer who has to figure out what to do. So there's all sorts of mechanical engineering that goes on on a ship, and the Navy's, uh, uh, and that's that's what our uh, naval graduates tend to go on to. Uh, in the Army, um, the mechanical engineers either go to RAMI or to the Armoured Corps or to the Infantry Corps, um, and typically they'll they'll do things like work in workshops uh, and oversee uh, mechanical engineering workshops, uh, or go into the Defence Material Organisation for a while and oversee again large acquisition projects. So that's basically um, what our graduates do. Uh, we also have what we call technology degrees, Bachelor of Technology. We've got two of them. 
The aeronautical one is basically the first three years of the engineering aero degree, and it's designed for those who are intending to be our air crew. So it includes pilots, but it's not just um, uh, for pilots. And it's for those who want a solid science and engineering grounding. We also have a conversion uh, degree where you come back for one year and you can convert your BTEC aero into a BE aero by basically just doing the last year of the BE degree. We have a BTEC aviation, which is mostly designed for those who are intending to become pilots, but you know, air crew get involved as well. Um, and it's also useful for folks who want to become uh, air traffic controllers and stuff like that. And it's more about um, uh, the system's approach to uh, safe air, uh, operation of aircraft. So it's more about the relationship between people and the machinery rather than just the machinery. And so to give you an example of that, one of the things they do is they look at behavioural science to figure out when an air traffic controller might go into um, intellectual meltdown because they've got too much um, information coming to them. So it's, it's that kind of stuff. OK, let's finally talk about IT. Um, most modern systems incorporate large software components. Um, to give you an example, a modern fighter aircraft has all of the aerodynamic properties of a brick. Um, and that means that to get off the ground, stay in the air, and to land safely, you need a whole bunch of software to keep this thing actually operating. Uh, and you know, they're safety critical systems in an aircraft, so that they're important. Um, and the complexity of software these days is a really big issue. So what I'm going to do now, uh, this is a summary of our BTEC and um, BE degrees. There's another slide in a second for um, our IT qualifications. This is the moment where I'm going to pause and I'm going to let you ask all of the, the questions that have been burning in your minds since you walked through the front door. And we just need one person who's brave enough to kick it off. Then we'll get an avalanche. Question, what does the CDFSP stand for? I'm so glad you asked that. You can collect your $50 later. Thank you. Um, so the question was, what does CDFSP stand for? Um, those, those qualifications are uh, what we call the CDF students programs. They are um, analogies to the, the courses that I've written in, in uh, black up on that slide. And the, the, these programs, uh, the CDF programs, have a much higher ATAR to get in than the standard engineering programs. They, you have to attain a minimum level of academic achievement to stay in the program. And the goal with those programs is uh, to get to the end of the qualification, you're going to achieve the same learning outcomes as if somebody went through the standard program, but you're going to take a completely different path to get there. And the different path is that instead of doing um, a whole bunch of courses that are very uh, carefully designed and scoped to aggregate together into a, into a degree, we're going to um, loosen the reins a bit and give, give the students problem-based learning tasks in their degree. Now, what that means is that much earlier on, it's about um, uh, acquiring and demonstrating the sorts of problem-solving skills that, that I was talking about earlier. Uh, and that means that it's, it's, um, uh, a, a, it's a much less tightly specified degree. Um, and what that means is that we need to, we, it's, it's really focused on our, on, our, on our very highest achievers. Are you going to ask me what the ATAR is to get into it? 98 for the engineering ones. What are the is needed? Good question. I'll look up my, my table I prepared earlier. So to get into the, uh, our CDF programs, it's an ATAR of 98 and an OP of 2. Can you move from the student degree up into a CDF degree if you show aptitude? Good question. Um, the answer is yes. So um, we, there are two entry points into the CDF degree. One is you come in from uh, right from the start in the CDF program. The other is... Um, if you do really, really well in your first year, we will invite people to, to join the CDF program um, either at the end of first semester or at the end of second semester. What kind of career options after the military would you find for, for example, the BTEC era? After the military? Yeah. Um, all of our qualifications are um, fully accredited by Engineers Australia. So Engineers Australia is the professional engineering body um, in, in the country. Um, and uh, what they do is they, they actually ensure that everybody who graduates from a, an accredited degree program in Australia is able to um, 
have international mobility and be, actually be able to say, I am an accredited engineer in Australia, which means I'm actually licensed to operate as an engineer in Europe or the US or whatever. Um, and Engineers Australia uh, equally has accreditation for BTEC qualifications as well. And our BTEC degrees are also fully accredited by Engineers Australia. Um, the main difference between uh, that Engineers Australia considers between B BE and BTEC is the um, design component and the, the systems engineering project management component. So um, somebody with a BTEC is well able to go off and um, ha pursue a really happy career in a particular technical specialisation. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah good. <laughs> One, two. What's the um, difference in career pathing and electric for the CDF course as opposed to, say, the um, the, the advice, so, so one of the curious things about this place to remember is that, that um, from, the, from the university side, I'm with UNSW, I'm not with the ADF, the advice we get from the ADF is that uh, the, in the first couple of postings after leaving here, um, the, having, a, having the CDF version <laughs> versus the standard version makes little difference. But um, one of the really great things about the Australian Defence Organisation is that it really understands the concept of lifelong learning. Uh, and so they're really across the idea that throughout your entire career, you're likely to have to go back to university to say get a master's degree or something like that. That's the place when having a CDF qualification makes a huge difference because it means that you've already demonstrated that you're well prepared for postgraduate uh, study um, and it opens up a variety of kind of interesting opportunities. So for example, um, in the CDF program, the, the students develop a fairly close mentoring relationship with an academic. Um, and one of, one of my former CDF students, just six weeks ago, has just started doing a research master's in UAVs at MIT with the, with the full blessing of, of the Air Force. Um, and he just would not have got in there without having done the CDF program. What subjects do you suggest doing at school if you want to do engineering? Um, physics, maths, chemistry, that sort of stuff. Uh, and the, the reason um, for it is that uh, you need all of those literacies to be an engineer. Uh, and in, our, in the first year that we give um, uh, all of our engineering students, Basically, what you're doing is physics and maths and a bit of chemistry. <coughs> uh, and certainly life will be a whole lot nicer in first year if you've, if you've got some background in that. Um, I think the information session, they were talking about the mathematics levels. Yes. And that sometimes students don't come in with a high enough level. Yes. Um, in New South Wales, we've got two in an extension, one mathematics. Is it better for a student to come in on the highest level of mathematics ability? Um, so that, that's, that's a really good question. Um, we're actually the only truly national campus of a, of a university anywhere. Even the Australian National University draws most of its students from the ACT in New South Wales. Um, and what, what we see, so we've been doing some tracking of educational outcomes in first year, as both as a function of what state the students came from, but also what level of mathematics they came into the program with. What we're finding is a very strong variation in um, uh, first year outcomes as a, as a consequence of what state people came in from. Um, we're also finding a very strong correlation between the degree of mathematics that they've done in high school and how well they do in their first year. This is not about, uh, and, it, it, and I should emphasize, this is not about saying that people are gonna be behind the eight ball for their entire degree, but first year, um, a lot of the goal of first year mathematics, first of all, is to get everyone to the same level and then to extend beyond high school. Uh, and if you're having to catch up from further behind and then stretch, stretch beyond that, it's, it's just more work and it's more tough. Um, and so the more, you can, the more you can bring with you at the start, the easier first year will be. So would it be recommended then that rather than just doing two units in mathematics, they're doing the three units? Um, so certainly, if you can do the, the more maths you can do in high school, the easier it will be in first year. Okay.
mechanical engineering in the Air Force. Yes. It's not really uh, mentioned. What career path do you have from mechanical engineering in the Air Force? Um, Mech in the Air Force. There we go there. Um, we actually, so far as I'm aware, there aren't actually very many mech engines in the Air Force. Um, I can take that question under advisement if you'd like. Um, I'm just, I'm trying to visualise the, the colours of the uniforms of the people we've got in the mech engine program, and they're mostly Navy and Army. I actually don't think I've ever seen any, I, I can't remember seeing blue very often. Sorry. Um, just a question on the Bachelor of Engineering. Yep. Is the first year like a common year and then they get a bit of a taste of the different major areas they could get into? Or? Um, good question. So, so the question was, is there a common first year and what choice is there after that, essentially? Um, so students come into this place um, having already declared what flavour of engineering they're going to do. From the university's perspective, um, we have a well-defined process for changing between those, those degrees. Um, first year for, for all of our engineering degrees bar electrical is absolutely common. Um, and electrical is, it has a 50% overlap with the other ones. So what that means is that from the university's perspective, it's dead easy to change between degrees up to the end of first year it's reasonably easy in second year and it gets harder and harder thereafter. Um, the biggest issue is actually convincing the student's employer that, that actually, no, while they thought that they needed a mechanical engineer, they, they really wanted a, an electrical. Um, and that's actually the, 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 um, the more significant uh, uh, business case that needs to be mounted. Is there a research component to any of the um, studies? Uh, the CDF program has a very significant research uh, series of research projects all the way through. Um, uh, in the standard programs, <laughs> every engineering student takes what we call a final, under, uh, final year project, and it's the, it's the place where they're meant to basically pull, it's the capstone of the whole program, <coughs> and it's the place where they pull together all of the um, basic factoids and techniques and stuff they've learnt throughout their preceding three years and pull it together to achieve some kind of education, uh, engineering outcome in fourth year. Um, that has a very significant research component in it because if you're going to exercise your professional engineering judgment, just making a guess and going for it is probably not the right way to go about doing that. Any more for any more? Um, we're reasonably agnostic about that. <coughs> um, uh, you know, we're engineers, right? You're lucky we can spell engineer. <laughs> um, but to be fair, um, technical communication is actually a really important part of engineering, particularly when you um, start to go into uh, acquisition projects and things like that. So it's, it's something that we do pay attention to uh, and we get students to, to write reports all the way through and they've got, they've got a, you know, a very significant um, document they have to write at the end of fourth year. Um, but we, we, we don't set any particular requirements um, on entry. Just wondering how prescribed the courses or is there room in the end? Is yep. there room to add some sciences in if they wanted to? Uh, so the, the bachelors, the, the engineering and technology degrees are um, prescribed in the sense that, that you've kind of already selected your major by saying I want to be a civil or a mechanical or an electrical. Whereas in the, say the BSc you actually get until the end of first year to decide if you're going to do a major in chemistry or aviation or physics or whatever. Um, in our engineering degrees we, there, we have a mix of what we call core courses so you have to do it because we think this is absolutely essential stuff for a mechanical engineer to be able to know and do. And then there's a bunch of electives thereafter. And that's where people get the choice to explore areas of interest, really focus on a particular specialisation, whatever. Some of those electives come from science. I'm just wondering from the intake, is there a certain percentage that go on to year two, like roughly speaking? Uh, you're talking about attrition rates between yeah. first and second year. Um, 
the, 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 highest, the highest attrition rate is indeed between first and second year. And it's mostly to do with um, not so much about the, the intellectual horsepower of the people who are in the program. It's about whether or not engineering is actually a good fit for them. Um, and I, I would guess, on average, about 90% of students go through from first year to second year in, in, in engineering. Those who don't tend, they don't disappear, they tend to go to science. And it's because they, you know, they, they've still got that same interest in physics, chemistry, maths, all of, all of the rest of it. They're just, it's just that science is a better fit for them than engineering. Um, sorry, just for, yep. in, in your liaison with the defence side of the house, are both sides fairly flexible with any transitions? Um, we certainly are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, no. So, so the BTEC aviation is 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 open to um, uh, air crew in general, and in fact. Uh, from our perspective, we're not particularly, um, we're, we're, we're quite open to, to people enrolling in the BTEC aviation from, from anywhere. Um, it's mostly, again, about what, what your prospective employer is interested in recruiting into. Um, the, the other thing is that we also teach an aviation major into the Bachelor of Science. So it's possible to enrol in a BSc and do an aviation major. And in fact, we've actually, for the first time, we've got a student who's enrolled in the BSc CDF program doing an aviation major. <laughs> any more for any more? No? OK, everyone's got ATARs and stuff. They know what ATARs they need to get into the various things. Speak now, forever, hold your peace. OK, so now let, let's talk a little bit about IT. Um, uh, IT basically has three main sub-disciplines. They are um, computer science, which is about um, software engineering, writing code, that sort of stuff. Information systems, which is more about the interaction between people and software and also about organisations and software in the sense of how do you decide um, what piece of software to buy so that it's most likely to be used by the organisation and all that sort of stuff. And there's also operations research, which is about modelling complicated things. Um, so for example, uh, the, the way to work out what's the most efficient way to run a production line is so complicated that you can't do that with a pencil and a piece of paper. Um, so operations research people do that. Um, so if you're interested in all three and you want a broadly based IT degree, the Bachelor of IT is the way to go. If you're interested in one of them and you want to explore other aspects of either arts or science, the way to do that is to do a BSc or a BA and take a major in computer science, operations research or whatever. Any questions about IT? No? Okay. Um, so as I said, we also have postgraduate de um, degrees. Uh, I'm flagging this now because one of the things that's really important is the, the concept of lifelong learning. There are basically two types of master's courses programs that you can do um, in a few years after you've finished your, your degree. One is to do to get really, really specialised in a particular area. And there, there, are, there are things like the Masters of Engineering Science and the Masters of IT. The other, the other way to go is to pull up away from your area of technical specialisation and become more broad. Uh, and that's the flavour that's most popular in the Department of Defence at the moment. Uh, and that's where things like project management and systems engineering come in. So, uh, and, and they're the sorts of things that, that you'll, you will be having, believe me, you've, it may feel like it's forever away now, but you will be having these conversations with your employer in five or six years' time. There are also um, research qualifications. So there are master's level research qualifications. There are what we call professional doctorates where people are making um, uh, a contribution to the net knowledge of their profession. And then there are the PhDs where people are actually at attempting to incre the net, increase the net knowledge of the world. Okay, so we've already spoken about um, some of these things. Um, the, way the way things work, um, degrees run for a certain number of years. We break our years into two semesters. There are four courses per semester. Um, and there are a mixture of core and elective. Um, 
advice is free, so you take it, you, you get what you pay for. Um, consult the handbook, read as widely as you can, really look out, look up what it is you're interested in doing. Ask questions, seek advice, talk to me today, go online tomorrow, whatever. Um, and just I'm really going to quickly finish off with a series of um, pictures that, that illustrate the, uh, the uh, facilities and equipment we have in the school. As I said, we're still v relatively, um, relative to the rest of the country, we're well equipped uh, in terms of having really cool equipment and infrastructure that our undergraduate students get to interact with. So um, we have materials engineering that goes on in the school uh, and so you need ways of testing that to make sure that, for example, if you're going to invent the world's next um, best thing in terms of putting wings on aircraft, they don't snap off when you first fly. Um, we can actually make these materials, which is really cool. Um, we have a very large and dynamic um, UAV uh, group, mostly focused on, on uh, rotary wing. Unfortunately, we crashed that helicopter um, earlier in the year, which is why it's not on display for open day. Um, but we, like the $6 million man, we do have the technology. We will put it back together. <laughs> um, we, have the anechoic, we have an anechoic chamber. Anechoic means no echoes. Uh, it's really weird. You walk in there and your sense of balance actually comes from, from actually hearing the sounds around you and they just all go away and you, it's very disorienting. Um, and whenever I go in there I always take a key because if you get locked in no one can hear you scream. <laughs> um, one aspect of mechanical engineering is automotive engineering. So we have engines and we have hub dynamometers and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and we have shock tubes. We also have a hypersonic tunnel. Um, this tunnel is involved in um, uh, designing engines that go on scramjets and uh, various things like that. These, these are um, jets that travel so fast that they can actually take our atmosphere and burn that to make fuel. They travel at about Mark 17 or so, which is really, really fast. Um, we have dirt and concrete. Um, it's a soils lab and we can test test all sorts of soil related things and um, the sorts of interesting questions there are stuff like um, uh, if I take wet soil um, and shake it a lot will it will the soil and the water separate does that mean my roads going to collapse how strong is my bridge going to be that I build on it all of that sort of stuff so there's lots of testing that goes on there um, we have an aircraft accident investigation studio so this is part of the aviation side of things um, and we can actually go back and look over how accidents happen. This is about human machine interface. Um, we've also got a couple of cool helicopter simulators these days that indeed our third year students do get to fly and crash quite regularly. Um, we're also one of the few universities uh, left in the country that have a uh, student mechanical workshop um, and we put all of our first year students through one of our courses. They actually learn how to drive all sorts of machines to, to machine stuff up for themselves. Um, we have a uh, fully staffed production mechanical workshop that's got fully quali qualified tradesmen in there um, and they support the operations of um, the school. And uh, to give you an indication of what, what our students do, we have a, a design and build competition in first year. So these, these um, uh, officer cadets and midshipmen are only about three or four months out from high school and they're um, designing and building uh, bridges in competitions to, to see how much load they can actually take and yes they are indeed paddle pop sticks um, but it's amazing if you design it properly it's amazing what load they can take um, and you know we've, we've run competitions for years there's also a national competition called the warm and design and build competition every year a cool um, hypothetical engineering design problem is posed uh, and uh, Students from all, all universities all around the country get involved in the competition. There are local finals, there's a national final and all the rest of it. And um, we have had representatives go to the national finals over the years. And of course we have uh, our Formula SAE car. Um, and wow, that's just a really cool photograph. <laughs> that's just so cool. Um, and on that note, I'll be quiet. Thank you for coming, enjoy the rest of your day. And I'm still here if you want to ask any questions later on.